is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 512. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources and joining me on the line, it's Louis Scott Vargas. He's in Denver. Louis. <laughs> That's how I imagined my head, at least. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, that kind of worked. It was pretty good. What's up, buddy? How's your day? What's going on? Oh, things are great. Uh, my Really, the only thing I have a qualm about is that uh, today was our first cold day since basically summer ended. So uh, it makes me feel that summer has, in fact, ended, which I, I'm not a fan of. But other than that, I mean, cool. tons of great magic. Uh, I've been playing so much magic recently, which is funny because I'm not even preparing for a, a given event. I'm just on there jamming. You know, standard, modern, vintage, and then drafts. You, you keep like pinging Paul and I and being like, "Oh, this this modern deck is sweet." And I just finished <laughs> a video in vintage, and I'm like, and then you know, and then we start talking about limited once the new format hit, and it was clear that you were jamming a bunch of drafts in that too. I'm like, "Wow, this guy's going nuts over there." Turns out you actually love magic. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 think I, I always I mean, knew that. Yeah, I, 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 I've never gone to like no magic, but this, I'm definitely near my peak in terms of how much I'm just playing. And I am also uh, keeping track of all my draft results because I've just, I've only been drafting on Magic Online besides like one arena draft I did on stream. Um, and uh, it's been interesting to see that too. I, I have also only been playing on Magic Online. I think I did uh, two drafts on arena so far and all the rest. Which is probably ten ish or so have been on uh, on Magic Online. I have actually I, didn't do a uh, a real life pre release this time around either. I, I just stayed oh, home I and actually drafted. Did one of those? I was at TwitchCon and they had uh, the Magic huh. pre release at the, in the tabletop area, so I, I got to <laughs> crack open two folio fancies, which. This is a card we'll talk about, but you know oh, we got yeah. a lot to get to, so I guess uh, that is a nice one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple things to cover at the front here. First things first, our sponsor is ChannelFireball dot com couple of things to mention with them. First thing, you can sell your cards back to them. Did you know this? You can take your cards, any old rares or, you know, maybe a deck that you don't play anymore. You can dismantle it and go on channelfireball.com slash buy list. And over, and you could just search up each card. You can find out which edition you have, and then uh, it'll tell you how much they'll give you for it. And you'll have two options. You can either just get money. That's nice. That's easy. Or you can get store credit. You'll get 30% extra in store credit. So the, the reality is if you were going to buy magic stuff with it anyway, at some point, a box down the line, maybe you're, you you want to upgrade to a different deck or change out of a format or whatever, then getting that 30% is kind of a must. You just can't really throw away that kind of value. Now, if you just need the money, sure, get the cash. That's fine. But if you were going to uh, trade that in uh, for, for magic stuff at some point, you should definitely take advantage because 30% is a lot on that. That's channelfireball.com slash buy list. And while you're over at CFB, you can sign up for a newsletter. That's right. There are three different newsletters that you can take part in at channelfireball.com slash newsletter. It's real easy. Just three check boxes. You can pick which ones you want. There's kind of a current events standard ish one that Luis writes. There's a modern based one that Matt Nass writes. And then the raging Levine himself, Eric Levine writes the one for commander. So pick the ones that are most applicable to you. You'll get some awesome free content in your mailbox as well as sometimes some cool little bonuses and offers as well. The show is also brought to you by you via the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash limited resources. And man, it's crazy. Uh, just want to take a minute to reflect here, Luis. Did you know that it was on today 10 years ago that the first episode of LR went up. It was wow. 2009. And uh, this is the day after my best friend Jay's birthday. So I, that's how I remember. It either went up on the on his birthday or on the day after. I can't remember. But yeah, th th that was the first one. And it has now been 10 years, which it's interesting because I'm kind of tying it into the Patreon because it's become such a big part of my life and, and you know, your life and, you know, everybody that's uh, been associated with the show um, but it didn't start out that way. It just started out as, uh, you know, something that we wanted to do for fun. And it made some sense for, for Ryan's career goals at the time. And I wanted to start a podcast because I had actually been listening to them for a few years prior. Uh, I had been driving a truck. And when you drive a <laughs> truck all day, <laughs> I mean, for a living, you know, that was my yeah, job. Yeah. And it was like, man, y you needed something. And I was always kind of ahead of the curve on the technology stuff. And I found podcasts. And this was in, you know, 2006, something like that. And they were brand new, maybe 2007. I mean, they were really new and there weren't that many. The ones I listened to were actually about technology. They were tech ones talking about computers and, and other podcasts and stuff like that. Cause I was always into that kind of stuff. And, um, 
Yeah. And I remember when Ryan and I, when he first started teaching me and some of our other friends, Magic and specifically Limited, you know, we realized we were just having these long discussions about it and we should just record them and put it up as a show. And when we listened to the current Magic offerings at the time for podcasts, there really wasn't a whole lot there for Limited players. So we decided to do it. Our first one was about Zendikar. That that was uh, the what was coming out. So we talked about that first things first. And now it's been 10 years. And even though it wasn't my job when I started, you know, of course, we didn't get anything for it for years. We uh, played for or we, we did it for multiple years before finally getting uh, a small sponsorship, a very, very small sponsorship. And then we kind of grew it from there. But uh, if if you do count the beginnings of it, this is the longest job I've ever had. So, yeah, that's it's, kind of it's, cool. it's kind of wild. Uh, you know, I. I still think of myself as the new host. <laughs> I know I do too. I, I don't think we're ever going to shake that. Right. <laughs> Which is funny because, you know, as we may have mentioned before, uh, I, I'm actually the longest tenured co-host besides you, you know? Yeah. So, by a lot too. <laughs> yeah. By a lot. But I still think like, yeah, you know, I, I just, this LR thing that I joined a couple of years ago that, uh, you know, I'm still kind of getting, getting the hang of it, but like, it just, it, it's just really funny how, how those things end up. And yeah, but, you know, Actually, it's it's kind of funny that Channel Fireball and LR both both you know came out of the scene in the same year. Two thousand nine was was also mm-hmm. when we launched. So that we've been doing this magic stuff for a while, and it, it's so cool because we still just love it, and that yeah. is just a it, it's a real gift, you know that you, we we got very lucky, and I think we should acknowledge that I, we absolutely did. Our timing was uncanny, Luis. Your first show went up January seventh, twenty fifteen, which again doesn't feel that long ago. <laughs> that was a while ago. You're coming up on on five years uh, yourself there doing this. So yeah, really, I, I do want to acknowledge that. I also just want to take a moment to thank all the listeners, and if you're totally. newer to the show or if you're somebody who's just coming in. We're super happy to have you along. You know, Luis and I absolutely love this game, Magic. And the things that we like to focus on for it are improving at the game, getting better. And we dedicate this show and, to helping and ha- you do ha- that. Having fun while doing so. Dang right. I mean, yeah. You know, this, this, none of what we do, whether it's LR, whether it's coverage, whether it's any of the content creation we do, Channel 4, well, any of it, it's just not possible without people who like it. You know, the, the people mm-hmm. listening right now, all of you listening, you're what lets us do this. And we're very grateful for that because look, we, we, we're, you know, none, none of us growing up thought we get to talk about games, play games, commentate on games, whatever for a living, but we're here and this is what we get to do. And it's only made possible because we have, you know, all these fine folks who, who are interested in some consuming the content we make. They, they, yeah. they like what we have to say. And that is, it's very rewarding. You know, it, it, it does, really it does feel very good. Yeah. And we are extremely grateful to each and every one of you that listen. Thank you so much for listening and for supporting the show for all of these years. Here's to another 10. Now with that, it's time to get back down to business. So we oh, yeah, got a lot to cover we got here. A lot to cover. Right. We just got a sweet new format dropped on us. It's a tough one too. It's been really interesting to, to start to dive in. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about our first impressions of Throne of Eldraine. And what we like to do uh, on a first impression show is do multiple crack packs because that gets the conversation flowing. That lets us uh, kind of get an early impression of how we view the format as well. And then we have, uh, you know, a bunch of cards and archetypes and ideas and things that we want to talk about after. So let's get into it and do our first Throne of Eldraine crack pack Oh, man, I have a bunch of actual Throne Packs, too, from the pre-release. <laughs> oh, look at you. Wait, did you win them? Well, yeah. Nobody, I, I mean, nobody I, believes that you won them. I mean, come on. Well, I had two folio fancies. That card is, is, is nice. Okay, that is a good one. Oh, this is interesting. So the token that I got is an on an adventure card. Oh, right. Yes. It's it's a little token. You can put your adventure uh, creature once you cast the spell and exile the creature. You can put that on the on the on the little on an adventure token. Yeah, and that's of course because the only way that you can cast those cards or if you cast them for their adventure, then they got exiled as for they resolved. And those are the cards you, the creatures you can cast from exile. Any other ones you can't, even those, if they got exiled another way. So it's just a reminder. All right, let's get into it. First card out is brimstone trebuchet. This is the two and a red one, three wall. It's also an artifact. It's got defender in reach. It taps to deal damage to each opponent. And whenever a knight enters that battlefield under you control, you untap it. I have not had experience with or against this yet somehow. Uh, I played against it in a red-white aggressive knight's deck, and it was solid because mm-hmm. 
you really have to care about the pings and have enough nights to make sure it pings over and over again. But they had those things and it was pretty good. It, it also has reach. There's a lot of really weird cards with reach in this format. Mm. So kind of don't, don't, don't uh, discount that because that can be annoying as well. Why does but, it have one power? Yeah, to, to, to stop people from attacking into it. So it's not an O3, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm not a. <laughs> You're not a trebuchet yeah. expert. All right, fair enough. Uh, next Everyone is one knows uh, catapults are the superior siege weapon. So. <laughs> By the way, the next card is crashing drawbridge. So we have artifact creature wall times two so far. This one's two for an, a properly uh, pointed zero four wall with defender, and it taps to give creatures you control haste. The only time I've played this is in a mono green deck that had. Uh, what is his name? Lortho, Vor, Vor, Vorlo, whatever. The GGG44 that gets bigger and two of the um, red-green hybrid uncommon. I can't remember its name either. Wow, I better get these names down quickly. Um, yeah, ra- ra- Rampart Smasher. Yeah, Raging like Smashing Rampart guy. Yeah. Anyway, and the truth was is that I didn't actually want to play the Crashing Drawbridge at all. I just needed a playable. Um, yeah, not a big fan of it. think it's mediocre. Um, I think it's a little better than that. It's it's not, a, it's, it, I thought that we initially thought this was a card you'd be unhappy if it's in your deck. I think it's a card you're kind of like neutral if it's in your deck. I've mm. had good experiences with it. I was uh, happy. Because, well, it, I have found that an 04 defender is actually pretty decent in this format in terms of stopping some of the, the little dorky knights that are running around, mm-hmm. your youthful knights or what have you. Mm-hmm. That's and, true. And then when you want to, when you've turned the corner and you want to kill them, like this can actually go pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And, and it does slot other, into your curve no no mana ability uh, no mana right. to use the ability yeah the other thing that I I really do like is I I'm a big fan of um, Moonlit Scavengers I think that that mm-hmm. card the, the six oh, mana yeah. four five that bounces if you have an enchantment artifact and which you just need to make which sure you always do by the way you, you always do but part of that is playing uh, cards like Crash and Drawbridge so. Mm-hmm. While this isn't the best card in the world, it's also not the worst. I think the card is is, is, is certainly a, a a solid playable, not not a good one, but a solid one. Yeah, interesting. All right. Uh, next is tempting witch two and a black one three, and uh, when she enters the battlefield, you get a food. You can pay two tap and sack a food to have target player lose three life. This card's overperformed. Um, I actually fear this card. <laughs> it turns oh, out yeah. that the food deck can make a lot of food, and if they beat you down with a couple of green creatures and get your life total, not low, but just like medium, you know, six to nine, yeah. somewhere in that range. And they go tempting, which make a food and you look at their battlefield and they already had one leftover food. You're one food away from death with no more attacks at all needed. I spent a lot of removal to kill tempting, witches so far. I, I found the combination of ev- evasion because, you know, you can't block the, the ability and there being an abundant amount of food makes this card a lot more dangerous than it looked. Mm-hmm. Again, we're not talking first pick territory at all here, but we are talking a card that is uh, better than it looks. I respect it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next is red cap Raiders, two and a red for a three, two. Whenever it attacks, you may tap an untapped non-human creature you control. If you do, it gets plus one, plus one and gains trample until end of turn. I have not played this yet. Uh, I've played against it. I haven't played with it and it hasn't impressed me. It just turns out the, the double condition of having a creature and having it be non-human make, makes it a little hard to activate the, or, you know, get full value from the triggered ability. So I'm not, uh, I'm not thrilled with it. I agree. Uh, next is Wolf's Quarry. This is the 4GG sorcery. You get three 1-1 one, one boars and when any of those die, they become food. <laughs> I've actually seen card, this think, resolved once already. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a little better than it looks maybe, but it's just not great still. Mm-hmm. Like it's, this is not a, not a card I, I would be happy to play. And, and we, we said kind of that in the set review. I, I don't think my readings really changed. Yeah, same. Uh, corridor Monitor. See, this is the one that fits that description that you use for Crashing right, Drawbridge. Right, it's like a, a Crashing Drawbridge. This mm-hmm. is a one in a blue for a 1-4 artifact creature. And when it enters the battlefield, untap target uh, artifact or creature you control. Mm-hmm. Fine. Uh, Just whatever, right? Yeah. Filler, but if you need an artifact, it can do a thing. Uh, Prize Griffin, four and a white for a three, two, three, four flying Griffin. Another card I have not played yet. Uh, I assume it's serviceable, but not good. Yeah, it's it, it, it does basically what's advertised, which is you can play this card and – it will, you know, kind of dominate the air, but it's also expensive and vulnerable to removal, especially Reeve Soul. I really hate paying five mana for, for, for a card that gets hit by Reeve Soul. Here. Oh my God. They, they, somebody Reeve Soul'd my, uh, 
Sage of the Falls. <laughs> that is that is tears flowing. Uh, signpost Scarecrows. Next four mana for a two four with vigilance. It's an artifact creature. You can pay two mana to make a mana of any color. I have not liked this card. Well, I have played it and, and, and it's been bad. So yeah, I, I, I I also don't think that the color filtering is that like that's not really where I want to be. So mm, yeah, because the the thing the thing is a lot of the 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 cards that you're going to stretch to cast are like the quad color like hybrid cards. Like let's say you want to play like the blue white Hoan Arcanist Owl in a in like a blue green deck. Mm-hmm. This this doesn't really help that much because yes mm-hmm. it lets you cast it but it just makes it cost you know five six mana depending on how much. You have, and so you're just losing a lot of the efficiencies that you started with. Yeah, not a huge fan myself. I haven't played it yet. This next one's interesting. It's True Love's Kiss, two white, white, instant, exile target, artifact, or enchantment, draw card. Definitely would main deck this. Uh, this is interesting because normally, you know, we we warn people against the bar being, did I find a target? You want the bar to be, did I find a target? I'm actually happy to use, like, say, a plummet on or a naturalize in the main deck. But True Love's right. Kiss actually does sidestep that because if you can just find any target for it, you're going to get your card back and you did remove something and you I will don't... generally be able to do so. And then, of course, it scales up from there where it can be quite good. Yeah, I don't know that I've really played against a deck with no targets. Right. It's either food lying around. Like, there's some way that you're going to be able to – to fire this thing off. And the fact that it gives you the card back really does matter. So yeah, I, I would main deck true love's kiss again. This pack has been weak overall. There hasn't been a single card in here that I no, would be no, even no, no, remotely no, happy take. to first pick. Yeah. So, but, but true love's kiss is, is a little better than I thought. I wouldn't main deck the second, uh, our uncommons, by the way, those were all of our commons. That was a big whiff. Uh, ne- our, un- our uncommons though. First one is lucky clover two mana for an artifact. Uh, whenever you cast an adventure instant or sorcery spell, uh, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. Another card I haven't had a chance to try yet. I like Lucky Clover. I think it's a legit first pick. What? Dude. A legit mm-hmm. first pick? Are you serious? I mean, I'm not taking it over baking to a pie or any of the like really good comments. Okay, okay, but, okay. But but if you end up in a spot where this is the card that uh you know that that you end up selecting early, you can build a pretty successful deck around it. Oh, interesting. So you have this as like build around B territory. Yeah. Okay. Exactly where, where where I would put it. There there are just a lot of adventure cards, and some of some of them copying them is insane. Well, the best start, of course, you know, it's an uncommon is copying the Beanstalk Giant on turn three, where you just okay. go get two lands. Mm-hmm. But even copying Curious Pair to get, you know to treats to share to get two treasures, mm-hmm. or another card which is very underrated, we're going to talk about later, is the you know the Reaper, the the, mm-hmm. the the four five for seven that you can pay three and a black to make them discard two. <laughs> discard their hand. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that that's, that's a legit absurd. combo. Yeah, that really so, is. <laughs> yeah, Reaper of Night and Harvest Fear. Uh, I I think that uh, Lucky Clover is, is is a fine place to start. Okay, I, interesting. I would prefer to take it like like third or fourth pick. Like let's say you first picked uh, Bacon to buy a second pick Beanstalk Giant. I would take like and Black Green's one of the best places for Lucky Clover. I would certainly take Lucky Clover over like a Reeve Soul in that spot. Mm, mm-hmm. I think that's like a good comparison. All right. Now, this is this is where things get interesting. So our next card is Merrileaf Pixie. That's the green-blue 2-2 flyer that adds uh, the taps to add green or blue. Um, card's excellent, but Lucky Clover is uh, colorless sort of, right? Like how, how, do you, how colorless is Lucky Clover? Sure, it's colorless um, to cast, but it's not like you can throw it in, you know, your blue-white deck or something. I mean, you could, depending mm-hmm. on the deck, you could get enough Ardenvale Tacticians or what have okay. you. But mm-hmm. I think Lucky Clover is more a black-green card than any other color combination. Okay. And I think that Merrily Pixie is a stronger early pick, even though it's more committal. I, okay. I think I would lean towards taking the Pixie just because they're both kind of pushing you towards a color pair. But Merrily Pixie, all it asks is you are blue-green. No, nothing else. Okay. It's just if you're blue-green, this card's great. Lucky Clover kind of says be black green or be like, you know, green red or something, but also pick up enough adventure cards. You could de- definitely miss still on Lucky Clover. Okay. Yeah. Cause where I'm at right now is definitely Merrileaf Pixie, but also I kind of have Lucky Clover in that section where I'm going to make people beat me with it a few times before I start, you know, kind of turning to the dark side, uh, if you I, will. I've been on both. I've been on uh, both sides of it. I had it once in a green white deck where it was very good. Uh, Ooh, and yeah. I, bet you I had really three good tacticians. I had two of the uncommon green white hybrid, the the, the ranger that Jeez, makes two that one makes ones. Two one ones. Okay, that's great. And I had like a beanstalk giant, and then I played against it in a black green deck that was just disgusting. I mean, they, they also had beanstalk giant. That's a common feature, but they had a murderous rider. 
uh, and Order of Midnight, though there are some funny interactions there. Um, because the copy is mandatory, if if you only have one creature in your graveyard and you copy uh, Alter Fate, which is the Order of Midnight uh, adventure card, which gets a creature back from the graveyard, mm-hmm. the copy resolves first. The original one doesn't resolve, and you actually don't get to cast a 2-2. Oh, no. It, yeah, it, it so, gets countered by the game. Brutal. Yeah. But right. uh, in any case, I'm starting with Merrily Pixie here, but I think it is, I think it is a, a debate. Next is uh, Lock Dragon. This is the blue-red hybrid, so four blue-red, so four combination of either blue or red mana. It's a 3-2 flying dragon, and when it ETBs or attacks, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. So it's a oh, fine, fine enabler dragon. here, yeah, for the uh, for the blue-red deck, which has been it's, an early favorite. It's a really good repeated enabler for the draw two effects, especially since it costs no mana once it's in play. Like, you, mm-hmm. you get to play it, trigger your thing, the next turn's attack and trigger it again without... Uh, Without spending mana. Also, this is great in blue, red, or mono blue, or mono red. So it actually has more options than Merrily Pixie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like Lock Dragon here for sure. Uh, our rare is interesting. It's Linden the Steadfast Queen. This card's actually disappointed. It's white, white, white for a 3 3 legendary creature, human noble with vigilance. Whenever a white creature you control attacks, you gain a life. Yeah, she's just, she's nothing just special. Just whatever, so. right? Yeah, it's fine. My, I mean, not, my order here would go lock dragon or lock dragon merely pixie lucky clover. Now, what if I threw in a foil? Well, it would depend what the foil is. Okay, it's a venerable knight. It's white for a two one human knight, and when it dies, you put a plus one plus one counter on target knight you control. This card's been excellent in the aggressive white decks. That hasn't been and typically isn't where I want to be at the beginning of a format. But every time somebody plays a venerable knight on turn one, I'm like, wow. Like that thing's going to get me for six and then, you know, buff up a creature a little later. Yeah. I mean, Venerable Knight's good and that doesn't knock any of the other things off the list though. Yeah. I'd still lock Dragon here as well. So that's what I like. All right. Let's do another one. Actually, let me see. I should probably ship out the, uh, the Cracker Pack rares. This feels like this is starting to get about to that point. Yeah. How about, how about after, after we get all of these done? Uh, we'll ship them out. We got a Foil Knight of the Ebon Legion in here, a Vivian, a Narset, Nightpack Ambusher. Oh, there's this. Uh, <laughs> I forgot I put this in here. When we did the show with the coverage folks, somebody wanted to take Wolfkin Bond. I think, uh, oh, it was Riley. And uh, in order to prevent him from even stepping in that direction, I ripped it up on the show, so I have the ripped up one. Uh, it's not, it's not, not a very good one. I did what I had to do, right? He was going to advocate oh, yeah. that our listeners take Wolfkin Bond, and I had to step in. I couldn't. I oh, couldn't no, I'd it. recommend against that. Yes. Um, all right. So let's get in here. Uh, first ca- first card is Luis Scott Vargas commemorative card. It's Weaselback Red Cap. <laughs> uh, yeah, this card's, this card's quite bad. It's yeah, pretty it's bad. bad. We can just play that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> LSV says LSV is unplayable, and I agree. Uh, Garen Brig Paladin is next. Four and a green for a 4 4 giant knight with adamant. It gets a plus one, plus one counter um, uh, for green and uh, can't be blocked by creatures with power two or less. Solid five ball here. Not what I want to be first picking, but I've played no, this but- card multiple times, and it's like, yeah, that, that, that's a real magic card. That does things. Yeah, definitely a fine card, and it's pretty easy to get adamant on a five drop without too much trouble, even in a two color deck. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Wicked Guardian is next. This has been interesting. Three and a black, four two. When it ETBs, you can have a two two damage to another creature you control. If you do, you draw a card. I found that uh, people have been able to draw the card off of it fairly regularly. They have, yet it's still not been that impressive. It's just like <laughs> it's just shrug. Yeah, I, I've yeah, never really been just, that impressed with it. Uh, like, like my, I'm a little lower on the Wicked Guardian, a little higher on Gear and Brig Paladin, but they're still basically about the same tier, right? And they're also both not what we want to be doing here. Barge in is next. That's the red combat trick. Target attacking creature gets plus two plus two, <laughs> and each attacking non-human uh, creature you control gains trample. What are you laughing about? I, I don't think this card's great. It just is, you know, what it is. It's just uh, kind of a mediocre combat trick. But mm-hmm. I did not. Uh, Stop my opponent from attacking, and then I cast a deal three, the Scorching Dragon Fire on their creature, and oh, then no. they cast this, oh, no. and it was really bad for me. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> Before you declare attacks, I would like to kill you. Yeah, beginning of combat is your friend, so uh, don't don't, um, don't get hit by that. Next is Fortifying Provisions. This is the two and a white enchantment that gives your con- creatures plus zero plus one and makes you a food. No, Dwarven Mine. This is the the mountain that enters a battlefield tapped unless you control three or more other mountains, and it makes a 1-1 red dwarf. 
I think people should play these lands at about a third the rate they do. You think people uh, are jamming them too much? I'm kind of coming around to wanting like around 11 or 12 of that land type. This being one of them, but like I, I don't want to play this in a 9-8 deck. And I think if you have like a 12 mountain 5, you know, island deck, then it would be fine to play. Hmm. But I've gotten burned by them unless the, – the, the big exceptions are Mystic Sanctuary, the blue one, if you have a really good – spell or multiple really good spells like i had stolen by the fey in one of my decks and so oh god you better believe i'm jamming because getting that back just wins you the game mm -hmm. if you haven't already won it already and then gingerbread cabin in the in the food deck because that is like a pretty huge advantage dwarven mine in like a red aggressive deck it's just not that big of a deal and if you're like a red white knights deck and you draw this as your fourth land when you want to play like embreath paladin you're just gonna lose yes so, true yep so don't don't basically don't play these cards unless you have a really good reason to get the effect or have like you know twelve of the of that land type. Just putting them in because it's you know good value in a, in a nine eight deck is not going to work out. Yeah, I mean it depends on the one, right? Like in my well, mind, you can get away with that if it's if your deck isn't trying to curve out specifically every time, like in in a red deck, for example, here for dwarven mine. Because that is devastating. Like the curve out that you described when you don't get to play that four drop is like that is in many ways your game plan disintegrating in front of you. Where for the others, yeah, some, you know, some percentage of the time you have a tap land that you play on turn one, you know, that where it doesn't really it matter. It does depend on the deck. Or, but yeah. But even in a control deck, I have found it to be uh, problematic to just draw this as your fifth land when you want to play a five drop. So All right. my experience with them hasn't been great. Yeah, I, I'm a little more in the middle on them. I've been fine with them, but I agree that especially the red and the white one. Maybe you're just greedier than I am. Maybe I, that's I the... am greedy. That is true. Uh, next is Memory Theft. This is the two and a black sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it. They discard it. You may put a card that has an adventure uh, that that player owns from exile into that player's graveyard. So you can kind of stop an adventure short as well as take a card from their hand. It actually happens kind of more often than I thought. <clears throat> That it's, you actually get to nab yeah, the adventure it, sometimes. It's fine. I, I still think it's more of a sideboard card than a main deck card, though. Mm -hmm. It's just too inefficient, right? Uh, you know, three mana, sorcery speed, pretty pretty bad top deck, etc. Uh, next yeah. is Insatiable Appetite, a.k.a. probably the worst food payoff. One in a green for an instant. Creature gets plus three, plus three. But if you sack a food, it gets plus five, plus five. I actually think this card is fine, but it's just mm -hmm. not really what green's doing most of the time. Right. Like, it's hard to find a deck that is aggressive enough to want a, a combat trick, but also generates enough food to make this like a really good one. Because if this is reliably two mana plus five plus five, that is above curve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's it can a kill lot. Your, can, can kill your opponent. But I, I, I have generally found this to be a marginal card because, yes, green-white aggro is a real thing, but that deck doesn't generate food all that often because it doesn't want to play cards like Curious Pair. And green-black is just not – all that aggressive. You can have an aggressive green black deck. I have played against that. No, I haven't drafted it myself. Yeah, it's interesting too because the green black deck specifically has a lot of really good uses for food. And making my okay pump spell into a kind of good pump spell isn't really worth it. Like I, in many no. cases, rather just have the three life or use the food for something else. So yeah, you can play it, but it's not really uh, the big payoff you wanted. Queen of Ice is next. It's two and a blue for a two, three. Whenever she deals combat damage to a creature, you tap the creature and it doesn't untap during his controller's next untap step. But she's also got an adventure, Rage of Winter, one in a blue sorcery. Same thing, tap a creature, it doesn't untap on its next untap. Card's fine. Uh, yeah, I like Queen of Ice. Well, yeah. A little, exp little expensive to get mm -hmm. the full value, but still a, a very good card. And kind of what you want in, in a lot of these blue decks is a good defensive play or offensive play, depending on what your game plan is. That's right. Uh, outflank, another one that's kind of interesting. So outflank is white for an instant. It deals damage to target attacking or blocking creature equal to the number of creatures you control. And it's kind of been getting me, actually. Like, I'm like, yeah, dang, one mana and they killed my my thing, you know, my little flyer or I blocked and they and they and they killed my my blocker and got to keep their creature. You know, this, this is this card. It's hard to be like a real blowout without flank, but it has actually pulled its weight, um, at least against me. I, again, I haven't really drafted a lot of white yet. Yeah, it, it's a fine card. It's it's a little awkward in that the white decks want a ton of creatures, but also want a couple like combat tricks. And mm -hmm. this doesn't fill the room. It's not quite removal or a combat trick. It's kind of like in this weird uncanny valley of both. Yeah. But 
I, I do think it's a fine card. Uh, I think you know you, you you can outflank most people well enough. Just make sure you have enough creatures. That brings us to our uncommon. So first one is Mysterious Pathlighter. This is the two and a white two two flying fairy. Each creature you control that has an adventure enters the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. That's a nice one. Yeah, it's a solid. This is a solid adventure payoff and. It, it, it plays nicely in the aggressive, like, green-white adventure deck as opposed to the more controlling yeah. green-black one. It would be my pick here, though. I'd be kind of bummed. Uh, next is – Yeah, you're not happy. No, that. Deathless Knight. So this is the green-black hybrid card. It's a skeleton knight. It's a 4-2 with haste. So it's four mana, 4-2 haster. And it's kind of interesting because it doesn't have directly to deal with food, but then it kind of does. So it says, when you gain life for the first time each turn, return Deathless Knight from your graveyard to your hand. And the sacking of food, of course, is a way to do so. It's annoying. I like, yeah, I like Deathless Knight. I, mm-hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a pretty solid card. Um, I, 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 I'm not in love with first picking it just because it, these hybrid cards are pretty committal and this is yeah. not one of the better, like it's not one of the best ones. Like it's not Arcanist Owl or like Lock Dragon. Right. But, but I, I think I would take Deathless Knight over the Pathlighter. Yeah, I think I probably would do that. I would just take the Pathlighter trying to be an adult, <clears throat> but I wouldn't be happy about it. Oh, I definitely take this next card over it though. It's uh, Oakham Adversary. This is the three and a green two, three death touch that whenever it deals oh, combat yeah. damage to a player, you draw a card and it costs two less if your opponent controls a green permanent where this card is absolutely bonkers. I'm a big fan of this card and I would definitely take it here. Yeah, the adversary is great. You don't even have to ever cast it for the cheap amount to have it be awesome. And, uh, you know, it's just a really big threat here. Ooh, get the sleeve. We've got a nice one for our rare, and it will be our pick. It is – you get one guess. Uh, it's a mythic rare. It's a mythic rare ember cleave. It is questing beast. Oh, well, there we go. Yes. Yeah, questing beast, uh, that, that's a good one. So we kind of did it. That one was first pick. <laughs> <laughs> it's 2GG for a 4-4 Vigilance, Death Touch, Haste. It can't be blocked by creatures, power two or less. Combat damage that would be dealt by creatures you control can't be prevented. And whenever it deals combat damage to an opponent, it does that much damage to a Planeswalker they control. This card, it's a legend though. So, you know, if you get multiples, it sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a big drawback. <laughs> so yeah, easy questing beast here. And that one's going in the bag. So yeah, next week we'll do a, a giveaway for that. We got one more cracker pack to do here too. So maybe we'll find something more to add. I'll, I'll put this in and then the ones after that will be uh, no longer in there. Uh, all right. Car- first car- card is Flutter Fox. That's a one and a white 2-2. Two, two. As long as you control an artifact or enchantment, it gets flying, which is often as it turns out. Yeah, it's, it is it is often – it's a little awkward that it's not as often in the deck that wants the flying part the most, mm-hmm. which is like red-white or green-white aggro. But but it's still – this is a, a solid flyer in, in a lot of different decks. Yeah. To, again, not a pick – we haven't actually seen a bacon to a pie yet or something like that. The cards that really get your attention from the commons. Uh, next one is Foreboding Fruit. This is two and a black sorcery. Target player uh, draws two cards and loses two life. But if you spent three black mana on it, you get a food. Fine. It's a little deceiving because you normally you'd think, well, geez, I have to spend black, black, black. How often am I going to do that? Well, the truth is, is that most of the time you want a foreboding fruit later in the game anyway, after you've kind of emptied out your hand and don't have a whole lot going on. So it does happen a little more often than you think that you get the food. And if you do and you can use it or even if you just sacrifice it, you're actually up a life on the exchange. So not the worst. Um, no, I think it's fine. It, well, I also like that it has the turn three divination aspect of, hey, I need to hit my fourth land drop. You know, I need to cast this on three. Mm-hmm. You can still but, do it. Yeah. Yeah. You can always just do that. And then, but then later in the game, it also works with your food synergies, nets you a life if you have the time to, to sack the food and all that. Mm-hmm. So also, you know, and th- the way this format has played out, it is not irrelevant that you can target your opponent, both because of the life and because decking them is a thing. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'm sure you've gotten into these kind of games where both your, neither of your decks is a mill deck, but the way the game is going, you know that someone's likely to deck. This can change that equation really easily because you're like, oh, I'm a card ahead. It's the Black Green Mirror. What are they going to do? And the answer is, oh, they're going to cast Forbidden Fruit on you and you have two cards left. Right. And you're going to so. lose that game. So keep that in mind as well. And of course, the, the two life loss can matter there as well. Uh, next is Thrill of Possibility. This is the one in a red instant. Uh, additional cost to cast it, you discard a card and you get to draw two cards, which of course triggers yeah. all the cards that care about having drawn your second card, even 
if you do it on your opponent's turn. Right. That's why this is an instant uh, mm -hmm. Tormenting Voice gets an upgrade here. I like this card. It's a good enabler for one of the decks that I think is quite good. And the kind of the fail case of you take this card early, not that you're going to first pick it, but you take this card early, then end up like red-green. This is still a playable card. It's just really good in blue-red. Mm -hmm. That's where it really shines, but you can put it in. This next one is the card I would take out of this pack so far. It's Charmed Sleep. It's one blue-blue for an enchantment oh, yeah. aura. Enchant creature. Uh, when it ETBs, you tap the creature, and uh, the creature doesn't untap anymore. Yeah, I, I, I like Charm Sleep a lot. It just is exactly what Blue wants, and it, it it's so awesome. It just gives you an enchantment that sticks around for your cards that care about that, most notably Moonlit Scavengers. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. Uh, next is Fell the Pheasant. This is uh, one in a green instant. It deals five damage to target creature with flying, and you get a food. Um, but a sideboard card, uh, Mantle of Tides. We're going to talk about this one in a bit. It's the blue artifact equipment. Uh, for one blue, uh, and it gives a creature plus one, plus two. Whenever you draw your second card each turn, you can attach it to a creature, and it costs three to equip. We'll talk about that one in a bit, but it is not going to uh, jump over Charm Sleep here, that's for sure. Youthful no. Knight, one and a white, two, one, first striking Human Knight. Fine card, but again, not really enough to jump over Charm Sleep. Here's Roving Keep. No. Sorry, Luis. Uh, Henge Walker, three mana, two, two. Look, I, I played against Roving Keep, and it is not it is not great. <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> uh, Henge Walker is the three mana, two, two artifact creature, but if you adamant, it becomes a three, three, so no. Uh, this card, I really haven't liked much either. It's the Rose Thorn Halberd. This is the green equipment. It just costs green, but when it enters the battlefield, you attach it to a non-human creature you control, so you get the first uh, equip for free assuming you control a non-human. Um, but the equip cost is really oppressive if it ever falls off or if you need to move it. It's five mana. Man, I like free up front a lot, but boy, five mana just makes this almost useless, um, you know, going forward. The way you have to kind of view it is that it's like a, a sorcery speed combat trick that only goes on non-humans, and then you're kind of getting free rolled this like random, very late game thing that you might want to start throwing it around. But the truth is, not really in the market for sorcery speed plus two plus one on a non-human. Um, that that doesn't interest me that much. So I, I'm pretty no. down on the halberd. The best the best combo I've seen with it is Raging Red Cap because it's the that's the Goblin Knight that's a one two double striker. Ah, sure. Because okay. not not a human despite being a knight, and you can Raging Red Cap into halberd puts a you know a, a three three double striker is kind of a beating on turn four. Yeah, that but that is good. Yeah. Pa past that, no, the card's not not impressive. All right, that brings us to our uncommons. The first one is Animating Fairy, which is another one I think we're going to talk about in a bit. This is a two and a blue, two, two flyer, but uh, it also has Bring to Life, which is two and a blue adventure sorcery, and it turns a non-creature artifact into a, it puts it into a zero, zero and puts four plus one plus one counters on it. Card's good. I have, I've been really impressed with Animating Fairy. It's better than uh, I initially thought mm -hmm. because there are a lot more random artifacts floating around that this can animate. You know, Golden Egg is, is probably the best target overall. But animating a Witching Well is still fine because you get to attack for four on turn three. Mm -hmm. It battles hard. Yeah, I actually like it better yeah. than Charm Sleep. <clears throat> huh, am I there yet? Yeah, I think I would take Animating Fairy over Charm Sleep. I th it's close, but if you if you pick one, it you can just change your picks a little bit and kind of prioritize it the right way. Yeah, I, I just tend to go for the higher upside picks when I when they're close like this. And I think Animating Fairy is even if Charm Sleep is on average a little bit better. Again, like you said, you can I can adjust my picks to make sure the Animating Fairy is maximized. Uh, next is Foulmire Knight. I like this card too. This is the black one one Death Toucher. Uh, it's also a zombie knight, um, but it has profane insight. Two and a black instant adventure. You draw a card and lose a life. A solid little two for one. Mm -hmm. Foulmire Knight is great because it works really nicely by itself. Where it's you know it's again a two for one. You cast you cast it to draw a card, then you cast the death toucher and you trade it off. Great. It also works really well with the multiple raised dead effects in the format, like Forever Young and Order of Midnight. And it's a knight, and it's not a human. It just does all the all the different things you want it to do. It works with the adventure cards, like you know, L Lucky Clover with uh, Falmar Knight is very good. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, does a lot of cool stuff. I'm still probably going to take Animating Fairy, pick one back one, but I like the Falmar Knight. I don't yeah. know, it's pretty close. I would actually jump ship to the Falmar Knight. I just think that it 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 as just a built in two for one, and the one one Death Toucher is quite good I in guess the format. Yeah, I guess these are uh, comparable in terms of power level, except one of them always works and the other sometimes works. Right. And and so I would go for the Foulmire Knight. Uh, 
Interestingly, our other uncom- our last uncommon is Fireborn Knight. This is the red white hybrid. It's a human knight. It's a two three double striker, and you can pay its mana cost again. So four red or red and or white mana to give it plus one plus one until end of turn. Yeah, I don't like this one as much as the the uncommons so, or the other uncommons. Just yeah, taking a first pick, such a committal card when it's not that much more powerful than the other options. I would rather just take Valmire Knight. Here. Same, I would too. And then, wow, we got another good rare. This one's Gilded Goose, green for a zero oh, two Goose flying bird. Yeah, it's really good. When it ETBs, you get a food. You can tap it and sack a food to make a mana of any color. And then later in the game, you can pay one in a green and tap it to make a food token. This card's Certainly really think take, strong. Take the goose here. If it's in your opening hand, it'll accelerate your best play by a turn, which is great. Works really nicely with other food cards. Then later in the game, it just sits there making food every turn, which is a pretty powerful uh, effect in and of itself. It so really I'm, on, I'm on Gilded Goose here. Same. I like the Gilded Goose a lot. I'll put that in the in the giveaway too. And the way it works is um, next week, I'll give all of the cards that I mentioned. There's a few more in there as well from our crack packs We don't actually keep them. We give them to our... Uh, patrons. So I will uh, pick a patron at random and we'll give that away next week and then we'll start a new one. Um, okay, let's get into some of our first impressions here. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about the blue red deck because it really stood out to <laughs> me in my in my first drafts, not only playing it myself, where I think the first or second best deck that I drafted um, was a blue red deck, but also playing against it and seeing what people can really do with it. Man, it's good. Uh, I'm impressed by the deck. Uh, but the thing that really stood out to me were the payoffs, right? Because there are a lot of ways to get that second card at not a big cost. Some of them are cards that you just want in your deck anyway. And some of them are uh, cards that are like you don't mind playing in your deck to, to get those extra triggers. Cards like Opt and the Golden Egg that you mentioned before, you know, are cards that you can just sort of throw in and, and they'll uh, replace themselves and get you those triggers. But I'll tell you, that hasn't been the issue. Triggering these cards is not the issue. The issue is what does the card do when I trigger it? So I've got a, a power, my current power rankings for the payoffs for the blue red deck and it tied at the top at one A and one B are improbable alliance, which is the blue red uh, enchantment. Whenever you draw the second card, you get a one, one flyer and you can pay four blue red to, uh, I, I like to think to of loot. us as the improbable alliance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although, given our uh, proclivities, it was actually quite probable. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's actually. Yeah. I guess that's actually not really the right, the right, uh, no. the right comparison. But yes, this is the this is the the uncommon payoff that's very very good. Um, like you said, yeah. It, and, the, and then the it, other one is the Iron Craig Pyromancer, which is the rare payoff, yep. which is the two and a red O four Human Wizard. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, it does three damage to anything. So I I think that these two are pretty close. The Pyromancer is more powerful, mm-hmm. but also more vulnerable. You know, mm-hmm. you play this sometimes and they just resoul it, and then your whole game plan is kind of out the window. Whereas I don't know. Every time I play Improbable Alliance on turn two, I feel like I can't lose. And Me too. Fact, I, I feel really that's the same way. I give. A, I feel like I have inevitability on my side. In fact, one of the only ways that I lost without is I had um, two of them, and my opponent was on food and was at forty something life. And uh, I, I didn't get them down soon enough. And in order for me to activate them, I had to go through my library, which I could do quite easily. But I had seven cards left. And yeah. when you're drawing to a turn, you just end up dying. So that, to me, that's a, not an indictment of the card. That's saying how good it is, right? Like I was able to set up a scenario where I could consistently draw two cards a turn and had two of these things out. But it was so good, I flew a little too close to the sun and I died. But at any rate, these two are really in a tier of their own. The Alliance and the Pyromancer, these are your premium payoffs, but there's two that are just below them. There's Fairy Vandal, uh, and Fairy Vandal to me is right up there. It's not quite as good as those two, but it is excellent. And this is the uh, one in a blue, and it's a, a one-two flyer. It also happens to have Flash. It's an uncommon. And whenever you draw your second card each turn, you get a counter, a plus one, plus one counter on it. And that thing, if you play it on turn two, gets out of hand very quickly. Uh, it, it, you know, it becomes a dragon oh. after a few turns. I had a funny uh, game where I had Improbable Alliance and had 11 fairies in play, but it didn't matter because uh, I had also got stolen by the Fae. It didn't hmm. matter because they had a Revenge of the Ravens, which is a card we're going to talk about. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't kill them with those, but I had a Fairy Vandal that got up to a 7-8 and just killed them in a couple shots. Ooh, very nice. 
Wow. Yeah. That, and, and it is interesting because the other card that's in the same tier with the fairy vandal is the opposite. <laughs> Instead of going tall and high, it goes low and wide. It's mad ratter, which is the three and a red <laughs> one, two goblin. And it makes two, one, one rats when you draw your second card. Uh, so it lets you make a whole bunch of, of creatures on the ground. And this is another one that can just get out of hand and kind of dominate the, the ground game. This is the one where, if you can go like turn five Mad Ratter plus Opt or uh, you know the, the the Merchant of the Veil, or and then turn six do it again, you, you you're in a spot where your opponent's probably not killing you on the ground. That's like, right. It's just yeah. gonna be very hard for them to do that. Mm -hmm. I've also been patient with my Mad Ratter. I'm really trying to make sure that I Ooh. can set up the first trigger because getting it down on the battlefield just isn't that impressive anyway. It's just a one, two. And I really rather make sure if I if I at all can, like if it's not gonna be entering combat. Uh, that, that I can try to set up a turn yeah, where I can draw that card right away. It's mostly about the mana efficiency. Like, it's really painful to go turn four, do nothing, because you want to play Mad Ratter on five. So mm -hmm. you're probably not doing that. But yes, you'd rather prioritize almost anything else. That is one of the reasons that the Improbable Alliance might be a, get the nod over Pyromancer and Mad Ratter, is you don't have to worry about that with Alliance. Mm -hmm. with, the, with Alliance, you can just play this on two or whatever and not worry about it dying and then you know, start getting your value for it. Whereas Mad Ratter and Inner Crack Pyromancer, you really want to wait till you can play your cheap enablers in the same turn just right. to guarantee you at least get one trigger out of them. Yeah. And then if, if they go unchecked, then you will win in a similar fashion to Improbable Alliance and, and Pyromancer. They, they kind of go off. And then there's a really big break here. Uh, the, the, the last three payoffs are very much in a lower tier compared to the first four that we just mentioned. One of them is Blood Haze Wolverine. And this, th this is the next one, by the way, uh, that I have on the list. It's one in a red for a two one, but when you draw your second card, it gets plus one, plus one in first strike until end of turn. So under the right circumstances, this card can be pretty strong. You know, if you pay it, play it on two and you can uh, trigger it a few times, particularly in combat, it can be kind of a, a hassle for your opponent, but that's kind of where it ends. It's a hassle, right? This isn't the card that they just go, Oh, now I can never win. They can block it and force you to do things. They can call your bluffs. And sometimes they just cast a card that just has four toughness and they're like, sure, you know, make your Wolverine bigger. It can't get any bigger than that. So to me, the card's okay. And I will play a bunch of them in the deck, but it just isn't really the big finisher, right? It's no. just not the card that has the power that makes me want to play this type of deck. Also, I, I've kind of run into an identity crisis where you want to trigger on your turn a lot of the time because it's easier, right? Opt works on your turn. It doesn't, it doesn't draw your second card on their turn because you didn't mm -hmm. draw your card for your draw step. And that means Blood His Wolverine's a better attacker than it is a blocker, but these decks aren't all about attacking on the ground or even really attacking at all. I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not seeing this be that tempo based of a deck. We're talking about largely control cards. So mm -hmm. I, I had a, a blue red deck that just didn't, Played the two blood haze, blood haze Wolverines, even though I had a lot of support, just because that's not what my deck was doing. It wouldn't really accomplish much. Yeah, and it's interesting because they do kind of fight each other. Uh, you know, yeah, like if, if if you have improbable alliance and blood haze Wolverine in your deck, it's kind of like, what are we doing here? Right? Like, are we trying to make this game go long so I could take advantage of this enchantment, or are we trying to get this thing over? Right, and and I think that there's a huge gulf between Mad Ratter and then Blood Haze Wolverine yeah. plus the next two. Yeah, Steel Gaze Griffin is the next one. It's four and a blue for the two four flying Griffin. And when you get your second card, it gets plus two plus zero. Oh. Fine, fine, you know, whatever. It, it can kind of play both sides of the field here. It can be a two four blocker in the air, or it can be a four four attacker if you trigger it on your turn. It's okay, but again, it's it's a it, it ends up being closer to interchangeable five drop in the deck than it does to a big payoff that you need. And then last on the list by quite a bit for me is Mantle of Tides. Um. This card has really disappointed me, and I think it. I think you hit on why actually just a minute ago uh, when you were talking about well, what are we like? Is this a more controlling long game deck, or is this a get you dead tempo deck? And the mantle of tides is is the blue equipment, the one that we just talked about in the cracker pack that gives plus one plus two, and you can attach it for free when you draw your second card, but. That just, I've just found that that's just not what I want to be doing in these decks. I want to try to take advantage of cards like Improbable Alliance. And if I don't have Improbable Alliance or an Iron Crag Pyromancer or, you know, I, I want like two of those top four cards at least 
I'm not usually playing this deck or at least building around it to the to the level that uh, I would if I had those cards. And if that's the case, then Mantle of Tides becomes pretty mediocre. I thought it might be uh, creep up into the annoying category, but it's barely even there. It, it, it to me, it just uh, really isn't powerful enough to to do a whole lot. Um, um I, I've the only time I've been impressed by this when I was playing against a mono blue deck that had multiple Arcanist Owl and uh, Moonlit Scavengers. Uh, and then, you could just dig them up. And then it was just looking for artifacts and enchantments to bump that count. And then yeah. every now and then it gets to equip for free. But yeah, for the most part, it's not a very good card. Yeah. I mean, it, if we could replace those with Witching Wells, we oh, would. Well, we, we, which, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're talking about a completely different <laughs> thing here. <laughs> um, one of the cool combos that I did have, by the way, I wanted to mention was I had Sage of the Falls and Improbable Alliance going. And that is nice. That is a well, very sweet combo. There, there, this blue red deck is gonna it, it, it's a, it's a, it's gonna have a real fly too close to the sun theme going to it because <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there I have had many games where it's like okay I have the ability to draw my whole deck that's not the issue the issue is how do I win the game yes and and that, Sage of the yes. Falls definitely helps there absolutely it's almost too good but yeah but it, you you play a, a non creature or a non non human you get to loot it triggers the alliance then the alliance makes a non human and you get to trigger the uh the sage of the falls again it doesn't continue past that but still that's a lot of looting you basically have spells for the rest of the game kind of no matter what um monocolor deck so this is one of the big question marks we had coming in to the format was how viable are these going to be? We are clearly being nudged in that direction with adamant as one of the headlining mechanics, uh, as well as the hybrid cards. Whenever you see, you know, three or even four hybrid mana symbols, it makes you think, well, I could just put this in a monocolor deck. And it's interesting. They do, they definitely exist. They are a thing here. You should be uh, having them on your radar as a potential option when you're doing your draft. Um, they're actually still kind of tricky to draft, though, I've found. I, I have played, I think, three monocolor decks at this point. And what I found is, is that I was actually scrapping around for playables. Um, I was not in that fully comfortable position. There are some packs that you open and you're just like, there's no blue cards or there's one and it's crappy, you know. And so I have to either play that or I need to start looking for colorless cards like artifacts that I can do because – the payoffs, besides the adamant cards, which are kind of the obvious ones, which have been fine, right? I, I, none of the adamant cards have been like, oh my God, you know, if I cast adamant, if I cast this with adamant, it just blows my mind. <laughs> They're just minor upgrades. But the hybrid cards have been, uh, because those, there's a couple of reasons. One, they're colorless for you. Right. If, if, you know, and there's a couple of them that you'll have op opportunities on, um, if you're, if you are monocolored. So that's really good. And the other thing is, is that you just get them because it, like, like imagine you're in pack three, right? If somebody opens up even one of the better mon, uh, hybrid, you know, four color hybrid cards or four mana hybrid cards, they can't, they either can take it or they can't. That's it. They either go, yep, that's in my two colors and I can take it. Or they go, nope, that's not in both of my colors and I can't take it. And what that means is, is if that happens to be in the monocolored you are, you're going to get all of those that uh, you have a much higher chance of picking those up and they end up being um, pretty strong. That well, said, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say what, what, what you end up, what you're saying is you can get first pick quality cards for you seventh pick. Right. And, exactly. And that's a big advantage. And, it really is because draft is all about trying to set yourself up and, 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 you know, anytime you can get some leverage, that, that is an example of it. So yeah, I think that monocolor really is more about the hybrid cards than it is the adamant cards because mm -hmm. the adamant cards are mostly bonuses. The hybrid cards are really payoffs though. Mm -hmm. They're the big ones. Now, all of that being said, my monocolor decks have not felt amazing, right? It, I, I have not felt like, Oh, wow. You know, I'm monocolored. I've got a few of these payoffs. I'm good to go. I'm just going to crush everybody. I did win a draft with one of them, but I felt like I got really lucky with that. I had two of the owls, both of which I got in the last uh, pack, by the way, um, and, a, and a bunch of decent artifacts to go with it as well. But I have to say that these these decks feel like they line up a little below what my average uh, two color deck has been. And that's not super encouraging because if I'm not incentivized to take the risk on a monocolor deck, then I'll, I'll generally just try to uh, default back to two colors. Yeah. I'm not sure where I land here yet because I think, I think what's going to end up happening is the difference between a monocolor and a two color deck is not night and day. It's more like 
okay, I've got like actually good examples. I had two Arcanist Owls and I decided, you know, it's probably better just to be mono blue with like two white cards and pivot out of red blue, which is where I was before. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. these two Owls are better than all my red cards. And that's mm-hmm. and, and in exchange, I had to play my last three or four cards were a little bit like this is like the crash and draw bridge situation. Mm-hmm. So I this isn't like – on pick three, you're like, okay, we're, we're, we're doing it. We're mono blue. It's more like, okay, it's two packs in. I am like heavier blue than I am red. And I see a couple of these tasty blue hybrid cards. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm better off jettisoning the red or doing something, which I've done multiple times, play five of the secondary color or four of the secondary color, uh, lands and then just play like three red cards in your mono blue deck. Okay. So, so you're effectively splashing. Uh, a second color in a monocolor deck. Right, which you can do, especially if you have something like a golden egg that will help fix, mm-hmm. even though there's not that much fixing in general. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, interesting to see how those line up. Of course, um, I haven't had a chance to play all the colors yet, and there, there could be, you know, mono black might be the the thing, you know, who knows. Um, aggressive strategies. So far for me, the best aggressive strategies I've seen involve knights and For some sure. combination of the knight colors, uh, white, red, and black, uh, or even all three. I've seen a lot of that because there's these gold cards that are floating around on commons and stuff like that that are really big payoffs for this knight's deck. And, and just a lot of the uncommons in general uh, in knights can be really good, like Bell of the Brawl and stuff like that can come down and, and have a big impact on the game. Uh, green, white as a color pair. I have seen a couple of decent versions of that using the Ardenvale Tactician that we mentioned and a bunch of combat tricks and stuff. But generally speaking, the most fearful open that I have is when they play a couple of early knights because I feel like there's some really good synergy cards potentially waiting in their deck. And this isn't just uh, play out a bunch of you know decent creatures. They actually do uh, buff each other and, and do all types of uh, powerful stuff. Yeah, I think that the, it, the the two aggressive decks I've seen are the white base decks, which can be multiple different colors with white or red black. So the, the night colors definitely shine the strongest or shine the most in the aggressive strategies. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I do want to know is I don't actually think red, white, black three color knights is a is a good idea. Uh, okay. Besides, yeah, I it's, felt like my opponent's mana was sketchy, but then yeah, it, when I'm they sure hit it, was. it, it was like, oh my God. Like, Unless you, know. you have like two tournament grounds plus a bunch of like all knights. Mm-hmm. I really don't think that's the direction you're supposed to go because the mana just does not support it. But And, and you're there, trying to curve out and be aggressive. So if you miss yeah. mana, it's really punishing. Yeah. The, but the, in general, I think white is going to be the cornerstone of most aggressive strategies. And I, I really like the effect Arden Veil Tactician has. Yeah. Yeah, this is the one on a white tap two creatures and then white, white one, two, three flyer. Just having a bunch of those lets you swing games really quickly up to and including doing it at like the, you know, at the end of their turn or beginning of their combat, doing that and then untapping, hitting with everything, playing the tactician. And you just got, you, you just got fairly far ahead there, or you just top deck it later and just, uh, you know, tap to, down two things and play it in the same turn. Mm-hmm. It's interesting as well. The, the tactician, because it, it, it looks like a step in the direction that we've talked about on the podcast about, well, what does white need to do to be better as a color, especially in aggressive strategies and limited, because there's been kind of a, you know, murmurs over the last uh, year or two that white has just been, you know, kind of bad. And it's like, when you really look at it, you go, well, what is it doing? Like what, what is what it's making three twos. It's making some, cheap two drops that have like a decent ability. Like, why do I care about that? There's all this card draw and I'm not talking about personal preference. I mean, just raw power level stuff. There's just removal and, you know, better removal in other colors. And white seems to have lost its way a little bit. And I think a card like Ardenvale Tactician is exactly what you want to see at common to help get it back in the, in the mix, because it is a card that is an aggressive beatdown card that you can curve into and be happy with, but you can also draw late in the game and it isn't a two, one first strike for two or something where you're like, this does nothing anymore. This actually impacts the game in mul- on multiple ways late. So I, I really do like that the card exists because I think that white needs a bump and this is the type of card I want to see do it. Um, blue, black, Luis, this is, uh, this Ooh, is where we yeah. want to be blue, black. Now this is interesting because there's a couple of takes on this. Uh, in one hand, 
There's been a lot of uh, talk about the mill deck in the format. We'll talk about that as well. But I just wanted to note that blue black also is just a really good control deck, just a sort of traditional control deck. It's got cheap defensive creatures, really good removal, particularly in black at common with bacon to a pie and reeve soul. And then it also has really good card draw options too, like into the story at uncommon and unexplained vision at common that, uh, you know, can really powerful, uh, power you through to the late game. And it's just a, a potent long game combination of cheap interactive stuff and good card draw late it works i've drafted it a few times and it's felt powerful and like it had a good solid game plan each time i think that uh the 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 fact that there's actual good removal and actual good card draw makes this a better strategy than than it normally is because normally blue black has a baseline like oh there's a blue black control deck you know strategy to it but this time it's really good it's actually just really there all the tools are there yeah yeah so uh, I, I, I think it's pretty good and I do think it delves into the mill deck a lot. Not necessarily because it has to, but because the issue with blue luck, just like with blue red, is h- how do you actually finish the game? Yeah. So like, do you want to talk about the mill deck now or do you? Yeah, let's just talk about it. I, I mean, okay. there's two different mill decks, I think. There's the mill mm-hmm. mill deck where you're like, I have as many Merfolk secret keepers as I can get. I'm playing, uh, the, the uncommon apprentice, the one, two for, uh, for a blue mana that, that mills them for two. Um, overwhelmed apprentice and I have something like a folio of fancies and I'm just trying to go complete mill. That's just, that's my only win condition. Mm -hmm. The other one, which is way more common, which you'll end up in is you have this blue black control deck and you just have two copies of Merfolk secret keeper, one forever young and one run away together. So you can recur them a little bit. Yep. And didn't you're not get it. Didn't say please in there for good measure or whatever, but exactly. And and you're Mm -hmm. not trying to race them. You're not like, I'm going to try to mill you out by turn six or turn seven or whatever this uh, the, the the really turbo mill deck can do. What you're trying to do is like kill all your stuff, draw a bunch of cards, and then at the end of the game, mill you for eight or 12 to make sure you deck before I do. Yeah. And, and never having to have that big one creature that's your big win condition and right. then they kill it and you're like, well, now what do I do? This all just sort of happens within the flow of the game. And yeah, sometimes the 04 can block for a while too. Oh, I, I've I've been impressed with Secret Keeper. I think it. Mm-hmm. I think the fact that you get an O four attached makes it a legit uh, card when you need a defender and a win condition when you need that. Yeah. So I think that this is a very effective strategy, the 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 kind of light mill strategy, and it's a good way to get a win condition in your deck. I just don't think you're going to see that many Merfolk Secret Keepers late. I just think that the the secret's out. You know, the secret hasn't been yeah. kept. Yeah. That a lot of decks just want two of these to just shore up their late game against a control deck. Cause you know, imagine you're playing against blue red control and they're doing their thing and you're doing your thing. And then you just play two secret keepers. Often they're not going to be able to close and neither are you, but they have eight, eight, eight fewer cards in their deck. They, they're right. the one who's under pressure. And then uh, you also have the dance against forever young as another piece of this puzzle. This, that's, you know, the spell that lets you put as many creatures from your graveyard as you want on top of your deck and then draw a card. When you're playing against black decks and you're trying to mill them out, always keep that card in mind. Because it's so you, devastating. <laughs> you either want a counter spell for it, which is probably the easiest, or what you can do, and 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 I did this once, it was very satisfying. I, I held my two Merfolk Secret Keepers in hand until like they got 12 cards in deck, and I'm like, mill you for four, mill you for four, run away together, mill you for four. And they went from twelve cards to zero cards in their deck oh, in one turn that's for everyone's awesome. a sorcery. They couldn't they couldn't cast it and they you know they got decked. That but is amazing. That's you do fantastic. have to watch out for, and this is the you know this is the kind of format that I uh, I think we thrive in. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting excited. I'm like, oh, this is a sweet game. Yeah, I but, had a, a, a here. Go ahead, finish here, and I'll tell you. My I was story just going to say that a, a big piece of this too is that there's a lot of good card draw in this format, and a lot of good removal, and a lot of good ways to slow the game down. Food it kind of intrinsically does that. Gains so much life, right? You you mentioned playing with black green that has just has forty life because they just yes. eat a bunch of food. Uh, yes. Revenge of the Ravens also really can can stall out a game. I mean, that's a really easy way to make sure no one's attacking. Mm-hmm. And, and another because, reason why you want to be milling them out. <laughs> right. Because of that, natural milling is like an actual thing that can happen. That's why I mentioned foreboding fruit before. And, you know, Merfolk Secret Keeper plays into that really nicely. Yeah, it does. It's interesting to, uh, just on the grindy nature of the format. I, I found myself uh, where I was green, black, good stuff. I had Garrick and the Great Henge in my deck. I mean, my deck was absurd. And I faced what will be the best food deck I will face in the format. It was kind of a classic like week one only <laughs> type uh, type situation where my opponent 
also had a copy of the Great Henge, and they were doing all of the foods, all of the food interactions. And I found myself down on life in a very long, very stalled out game, and my opponent played the witch. And I desperately dug and found myself a removal spell for it. I killed the witch so that I, I wouldn't die. Then they had a ginger brute with an equipment on it that I couldn't block. So I had to once <laughs> again desperately dig and find a removal spell for that, which I did. And then they played another witch. And I thought, okay, I'm never winning this game. And I got super lucky and top decked another removal spell. I mean, this is in conjunction with the Great Henge uh, drawing me extra cards. But my whole thought process was trying to get my opponent to the point <coughs> where I would deck them. They were down to about seven cards left. And the Great Henge is not optional. And they had it on the battlefield. So they really couldn't cast any more creatures. And if they didn't have these passive ways to get through, the board was completely stalled out. And I thought, oh, my God, I am actually going to win this game. Like, I got very lucky. I was, like, super stoked on it. And then they played Forever Young and put, like, 13 creatures on top of their library. And I'm like, okay, this format is something else. Because that was – I mean, and that was a great game. Like, I was just like, this game is unbelievable. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of thing that can happen, especially if you're, you know, my deck wasn't actually trying to mill them out. Um, that was just a game plan that I adopted <laughs> out of, uh, out of necessity. Um, speaking of the, the green black food deck, it has been awesome. Um, the witch's oven has really overperformed. That's the one that you can uh, sack a creature to make a food, or if it's a four toughness creature, it makes two foods that just really like turbos out a lot of these food synergies and even some of the less impressive cards. Um, like the witch, right? That isn't, you know, premium payoff for it is one of the cards that can absolutely get the job done and, uh, and really crush your opponent in the late game if they don't have answers for it. And that's the kind of thing that when I see a card that low, you know, just a random common that's able to do that much, imagine what the good cards do, right? You know, the <laughs> yeah. wicked wolves and stuff like that that well, just dominate the board. if it lives and just yeah. starts throwing food at all their creatures. Exactly. And then, you know, one of the other things that I, I wanted to mention is the effect that the food mechanic has on the format. You mentioned it briefly a minute ago, but it seems to be quite profound because you know what else is good? Just sacrificing the food and gaining life. That has bought so many extra turns already just in the early stages where the aggressive decks are looking at an opponent that is not starting at 20 life. You know, they're starting at 26 and they have to do that much more damage. And when I go, okay, attack you with everything, it's lethal. And they go, cool, sacrifice the two foods that you forgot about. It's like, right, okay, you get another draw step. And oops, did I just leave myself dead? Right? Like, am I, you know, the threat of food activation changes combat. It's actually pretty big deal and that's not that's just using food for its intended purpose of of eating it and gaining the life rather than um you know using it you know with a wicked wolf or, or you know a bognati or something like that so i do wonder if the games in this format are just sort of by default are going to go longer than an average format by some percentage just because food exists and there's so much of it around yeah and you know the, the, this is that this is makes a never n never ending buffet <laughs> indeed people are going back for fourths all right, let's uh, let's uh, burn through a few cards that I just wanted to bring up. Uh, if, if we've already talked about them, that's fine. We we can skip. But there's just a few yeah. that I wanted to throw at. First up, <laughs> Midnight well, Clock. Okay. <laughs> yes, who, we who, know. Who, who, who let us know this triggers every upkeep. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. We appreciate learning that. Um, mm -hmm. We just got informed 50 times because yeah. <laughs> we missed it. And look, we, we already were kind of high on the card and then the card's just bonkers when it's twice as I fast. know. We had it what, in like the B range or something when we thought it didn't trigger it's just every an upkeep like, and now I, it's I've, just I've, awesome. I've, I've, I've answered multiple, uh, you know, what should I pick? Pick one, pack one questions. And uh, I've said and every, and every time the clock's in there, I've said it's better. I think it's better than any uncommon. It's it, So – Midnight Clock's great. Yeah, it's awesome. It, it 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 plays out in a really fun way too. It's like kind of suspenseful because it reminds me of like Ancestral Vision, you know, which is a suspend card that that makes you wait a bunch of time to get the cards. Now, Midnight Clock doesn't do the same thing it does because it draws you more cards, but it also costs you your hand. But it has this feel of like there's this mini game. The clock is ticking, and if it gets to midnight. I'm in such a good position. I'm probably going to win. And that's really all I need to care about from this point on. It also has the added benefit of shuffling everything in. So you get uh, you get a little extra there. Um, I love it. I love Midnight Clock. And yes, of course, it's much, much better now that we uh, uh, know that it, it triggers every upkeep. 
Um, what about Dance of the Mans? So I haven't actually gotten to play with this one yet, but I've had enough people talk to me about it, uh, including like uh, Death Sea. If you, if you haven't actually checked out uh, Death Sea's stream, he streams only limited and is very good at it. He actually, him and Ben Stark did a did a set review as well, and so it's I've been, it's been interesting seeing their grades for all the cards. But uh, mm-hmm. I, I got to meet him at TwitchCon. He's a real awesome dude, and uh, he he he's you know he tweeted a picture of uh, a Dance with the Man's deck that he went five one with. Um, so. Ooh. I, I, and, you know, that combined with a couple of folks saying, hey, look, look at these dan- this dance deck that worked out. I think this deck can get there. You need a lot of, like, golden eggs and, and cards like that. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it's not like a card I would first pick. But it's a card that if you're trending towards the blue-white artifact enchantment deck, this is a reasonable thing to take and build around or, or to help bolster that strategy. So okay. I think it's a, like a B, B minus build around more than, more than like an F. It's not an F. Okay. Uh, we talked about Ardenvale Tactician already. Uh, what about Fairy Guide Mother? Fairy Guide Mother is uh, very aggressive. Like the Tactician's partially good because it's just good in any deck. Fairy Guide Mother, I would only play if I was being, uh, you know, really focused on beating down. But the fact that you get a one mana one on flyer if it's in your opening hand, which you know is probably good for four to six damage, or if you draw it late, this is worth four or five damage right off the bat. Plus, you get the one on flyer. I like that combination. I think this card is a good tool for aggressive decks. Mm-hmm. And it, as we mentioned uh, when we went over it, for, by the way, Fairy Guide Mother is the 1-1 uh, flyer for white, but it has Gift of the Fae, which is one in a white sorcery. Uh, Adventure, Turret Creature gets plus two, plus one, and gains flying. It does knock off the uh, the Trapped in a Tower. <clears throat> Remember we were wondering about that. Yes, that that, that, that's, yeah. that that is a good interaction. Yeah, so that's nice too. Uh, Animating Fairy we talked about. What about Witching Well? Which, well, it's funny because uh, Unexplained Vision is another good common card draw spell. I like Which Well more. I think it's quite a bit better. Mm. I've had good experiences with this. The fact that Same. you can use it to set up your early draws and then cash it in when you have the time uh, is really good. And, you know, this is an artifact that sits in play for your, like, Moonlit Scavengers. And it, it, it can trigger the draw two stuff on their turn. It, all of that together makes this a, a solid card. I would I would say it's closer to a B than than it, where we started it. Yeah, it's interesting because it um, it ends up uh, fitting into multiple archetypes. Like you can find it with your owls, you know. So it works. It works in in, in multiple decks, and I like it a lot. I really like it. I, the, the thing that pushes it over the edge for me is what you mentioned of setting up your early turns. Namely, you keep a two lander. Right? A little bit of a sketchy two lander. You know, you kind of need to hit that third land on time where the hand doesn't work. Well, with the Witching Well, I feel much, much better about that keep, uh, you know, th- than otherwise because of the scry two that you get off it when it ETBs. Um, run away together has been reasonably playable. Um, this is the one in a blue instant. You choose two creature you control and one you don't control and return them to their owner's hands. Um, one of the things that's popped up that I wanted to mention, and I'll just mention it here, is carrying an adventure. Boy, does that feel good, right? They they oh, fire man. off their adventure, and I don't care how you do it, whether you uh, didn't say please it or whether you make the target for it invalid. It actually just ends up going to the graveyard countered rather than resolving and going into exile. So you're kind of getting both halves of the card at once. And a card like Runaway Together can actually do that pretty well against the green and white ones that target um, you know, there's the, the Garantry the tree Carver, folk. the Tree Folk, the one that we just mentioned, the uh, Fairy Guide Mother. Yeah, the, the, so, the, the Silverham Squire, yeah. the Silverflame Squire, rather. Um, right. Just a lot, of, a lot of targeted adventure cards, even against mm-hmm. like Murder's Rider trying to kill your own thing. Oh, that's really great. Yeah. Um, and then also there's, uh, there's a decent amount of enchantment based removal as well. Uh, there's the, um, the sleep that we, the charm sleep that we talked about before, the trapped in a tower, and then and there's also the so tiny uh, out of out of blue, um, and all of these uh, you you can return your creature that has those on them, and then the last thing is is you can just buy back your own adventure cards, and this actually happens fairly often, um, and replay the adventure side of it again and, and kind of do it for value. So at, while returning one of their creatures for a tempo loss. So I like Runaway Together. Uh, it's it's definitely uh, held its own and, and has a lot of applications in the format. Uh, Folio of Fancies. Ooh, I this do like this of, one. The kind of card where sometimes your opponent plays this and you just know you've lost the game. Because yeah. you, you're, you're looking at your hand of like two removal spells, a three drop creature and a five drop creature. And you're like, well, this was a good hand, but it's just not going to pressure them fast enough. 
they're gonna they're gonna win the game in like four or five turns with this card pretty easily, and I can't interact with it. Oh, plus, decks with Folio often have stuff like cheap interaction to take advantage of all the extra cards they draw. When you play with this card, here's the, the the play pattern I like. I like using the draw X like twice usually, and then start using the mill on their draw step. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, on their draw could, step's a key there too. Yep. Yeah, because it's after they've drawn for the turn, but before they've had a chance to play lands or uh, you know sorceries or creatures. So most of the time, uh, you want to get them up to like six to eight cards in hand before using the mill, because the thing is the draw helps set up for future mills. So it's kind of like got a force multiplier where like imagine if they have four cards in hand, you could mill them for four or you could have both players like draw two cards and then do that again and then mill them for like chunks of seven or eight. And that's Mm going to be faster. Plus you get access to the additional cards and you can find stuff like cheap blockers, ideally stuff like Merfolk Secret Keeper, but any cheap blocker or so tinies or run away together is just any of the the cards that don't cost a lot of mana that stop you from dying because Folio will outrace almost anything. Uh, I think this card's a first pick. I do too. And God forbid you're playing like a mid-range deck that's on the slower end of the mid-range or a control deck. Like you said, they play it on turn two and you're just like, I can't win. Another aspect of this though is they played on turn seven. You're also going to feel that way because what's a lot of the time, if you're not killing them right away, they're going to be like, okay, each at the end of turn, each player draws four cards. Then they like play a land and maybe play a creature and say go. And then you play something. Then they're like, okay, we draw four more cards. Now mill you for eight and then you're just dead. Or mill you for eight. Dead. Yeah. Or you just go draw four, mill you for six, mill you for six. You know, whatever it is. Yeah. And folio is good early, good late. It does take a little bit of work. But I'd also, if I open this in pack three, play it in almost any deck just because you, you get to dictate how it works. And it's a really fast win condition when you need it to be. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the card uh, for sure. I guess I'll read it. <laughs> Maybe I should have done that at first. Uh, it's a one of a blue artifact. Players have no maximum hand size. You can pay X, X, and tap it to have each player draw X cards and two in a blue to mill. Each opponent mills for the number of cards in their hand. For anybody that forgot, apologies for that. Um, uh, this is an interesting one. Into the story versus unexplained vision unexplained vision is the common so that's the four and a blue you draw three and if you adamanted for blue um you get to scry three after that and then into the story is the uh is the uncommon and this is the seven mana so five blue blue instant draw four cards but it costs three less to cast if, if an opponent has seven or more cards in their graveyard um Look, as cool as drawing four cards is, Unexplained Vision is usually cheaper, like on average. And what is better? Is draw four or draw three and then scry three better? Because I feel like the, you could make a pretty good argument for draw three, scry three, because you don't ever get to yeah. play all those cards anyway. And it really does set up your next turns. Yeah. And if you're looking for a specific card... It's, it's like if you're like, I need yeah. to find this one forever young to get back my win condition or whatever. Then you're six deep instead yeah, of four. Yeah, I, I like draw three, scry three more. And on balance, unexplained vision is going to be cheaper. So I do think it's just a better card. Yeah, which is really weird because I don't think that – I didn't think I would say that. But it well, has felt a little better to me. Is If you have like the three to four Merfolk Secret Keeper deck, at that point, unexplained vision is probably better because you're just going to play it for In, – Into the cheaper. story is better, you mean. Yeah. Or that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. The, yeah. Into the story is better because you're just going to play it for cheaper. Yeah. So interesting um, dynamic. But the truth is, is that they're fairly interchangeable. And if your blue deck needs card draw, you'll take either one. Uh, bake into a pie. Man, it's been really great. And, you know, I have to, I, I wanted to say that not because, yeah, sure, it's the best, you know, it's a black removal spell in the set. Of course, it's great. It's actually been better than that for me. Um, it, it being able to kill anything is fantastic. That's what you want out of it. But boy, the food actually matters. Like it is very real, not just in the, uh, in, in the, uh, food deck either. Like if I'm blue, black control, that food token matters a lot because the difference in the late game when you can just spend two mana and gain three life a little bit later can be the difference between an aggressive deck being able to get across a finish line or not. And, you know, every turn matters. If that buys you an extra turn, an extra draw step, an extra untap, that can be a huge deal. So, I mean, I'm really, really high on it, like higher than I normally would be on the premium black removal spell in the set. I think it's, you know, amazing at common in this set. Yeah, I, I mean... I only have one qualm with this card, mm-hmm. uh, or one, one one quibble, I guess. The fact that it's an instant is uh, not very flavorful because 
<laughs> you, what are you like baking someone into a pie like mid combat? Uh, it's a microwave pie. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I will admit this, this this objection got got pointed out to me by uh, uh, Eric Tam, who's actually a former uh, pro tour or former world champion many 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 years ago. Um, he, he he pointed out, you know, this this card being an instant really doesn't make that much sense. Like like what is going on there? So flavorfully, it should clearly right. be sorcery. He is right. Uh, another card that's really impressed is Reaper of Night. You mentioned it before. This is uh, the seven mana, four, five. And when it attacks, if the player has two or less cards in their hand, it uh, it gets flying. But kind of more importantly, um, it, uh, it it has Harvest Fear, which is three and a black sorcery. Target opponent discards two cards. Yeah, I and have liked the, Har- the format's Harvest been slow. Yeah, it's just been slow enough, right, to to actually get value. Uh, and and we mentioned this in the set review that look, if you're getting the full three for one out of this, great. It's actually a really good card. But we were hesitant because if you're under a lot of pressure, this is very clunky, kind of on at, on all metrics. It's the seven mana creatures clunky and the the discard spells clunky as well. But it, the format's proven slow enough that you can actually get away with it. In which case, yeah, it's just a three for one. I I have found it. Uh to be an effective way to leverage time, which these blue black decks can buy because mm. you're usually going to hit, you know, two cards on the first one. Often you can get this back or raise dead it or bounce it. And like, it's got a really good combo with run away together. Like if you, mm-hmm. if you play the four or five out and then later in the game, draw run away together, sometimes you can go like bounce my reaper, bounce your creature. You're, you're now up to two cards, cast harvest fear. You discard those cards. Then you cast this later. So, one of the reasons blue black doesn't always have to be the mill deck is if you've got two Reaper of Knights, that's a great way to finish the game too. Yep. It absolutely closes out the game. And this thing almost always has flying by that point anyway. Um, all right. Let's talk about Revenge of Ravens. This is the uh, the enchantment that, that we had a long uh, <clears throat> conversation about on the set review because it just had – there was red flags, right? This is a three and a black enchantment. Whenever a creature attacks you or a planeswalker you control, that creature's controller loses one life and you gain one life. It looks like the type of card that sucks, right? It doesn't affect the board directly. Uh, it's expensive. Uh, the later in the game you draw it, the worse it is. It has a lot that you can kind of point out that isn't great about it, but both you and I were like, mm, there's something about this card that just rings this bell that says it's going to be good. I think we got it into the B range, like a B minus or something, or at least I did. It's been good, man. Like I haven't had a chance to have it myself, or I, I, I shouldn't say it. I had it once, but I didn't get to play it. But my uh, my opponents have, and it is really annoying. And we've been getting a lot of screenshots saying, yeah, your guys' gut were, was right and uh, showing you know a whole bunch of small creatures and, uh, and a revenge of, revenge of Ravens, which is effectively just locking all of them out of the game indefinitely. Yeah, the, the, the effect of this card just ended up being a lot bigger than we had predicted. And you know, to, to our credit, we did say this this look this could be very well be much better than it looks. Yeah, so, I, mean, I, I gave it a think... way higher grade than I wanted to. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the card's pretty good. Um, Tempting Witch, we talked about. This is the one that throws the food at you. Um, Sundering Stroke. This is the six in a red that does seven damage. Kind of divide it around, and if you uh, and, and you can add a mint to do to do more or whatever. Um, I'm kind of always afraid of it. It's really, really yeah. powerful, and the games go long enough. And every time I see a golden egg or something, I'm assuming that I'm about to get hit by seven at some point during the course of the game. I um, just wanted to mention that it, it, it is uh, very splashable, which which we talked about in the set review, but that has come up a few times. And then I mentioned we mentioned these separately, but both so tiny and charm sleep. Really interesting because when you look at the blue removal in this set, those have both been good. Like So Tiny, really good for cheap interaction and Charm Sleep, just a straight up removal spell. And this has to be like the most well-rounded suite of removal we've had for blue. It just has a straight up kill a creature for three and then a cheap interactive one. And yeah, it's blue's way of doing it, but still they're both efficient and good at what they do. And then when you add in run away together and turn into a pumpkin at common and then uncommon, you can kind of deal with anything on the other side of the battlefield. And that's only using blue's <laughs> removal, which normally isn't the case. Blue is often one of the best colors in limited because its inherent themes are good. When blue's out of control good, it's when it has good removal because it doesn't always get that, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes it just it, it misses on the removal. It has good removal this time. Both So Tiny and Charm Sleep, like you said, are great. Run Away Together and Turn Into a Pumpkin are also very good. Blue just kind of has it all. So 
I, I, I'm not going to say we're pre- look we're predisposed to playing blue because we just enjoy it. But when it comes to picking like you know what what colors you're more inclined to draft or not, uh, when you know there's a competitive stakes on the line, like I think blue is just legit very good, and that's that's without me wanting to draft it. I just yeah. think it's going to be very good. Uh, it has I all like, the tools. I like your notes here. It says food, the life gain. <laughs> yeah, which we already talked about. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was probably the alternate set name for, for Throne of Eldrain. <laughs> <laughs> food, the life gaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, last card was Curious Pair. You've liked it? Yeah, Curious Pair has uh, performed. It's the kind of card that – you know, looks like, oh, if you're doing its thing, maybe it's okay. I, I've cut our creator to you're most of the time doing this thing and it's good. So mm-hmm. look, I'm not going to put this in my green, white beat down deck or my like red, green, just like mid range deck, but every black, green deck I've seen wants it. And I've liked it in blue, green too. If again, getting art, it, it puts an artifact into play for, for your scavengers. Speaking of which, I mentioned that card like three or four times. Moonless scavengers are just very good. Yep. It's, Really big on the board. A four or five is just a real card, and it bounces anything. So, I'm uh, I'm really in for that, and and I'm always looking for ways to enable it. All right. Well, big picture thoughts on the format is man, they've thrown us quite a format here. <sighs> There's a it's, lot to digest here. Yeah, it just feels like this is going to be one of those true, you know, fall formats where you there's a lot to go through. You won't know exactly what's best until a few weeks in, and uh, you know, I've been trying to scratch the surface of it and still feel like I'm, I'm I'm doing that. Where it's not obvious, it's not on rails. There's a lot to explore here, and that's kind of that's, that's what I want to be honest. Uh, coming off of a core set. You know, definitely. I'm, I'm really happy with this format uh, a week in. Well, we'll, we'll check in next week. And, uh, you know, I think our you know, so, sometimes what, one of the things that ha- will happen is, you know, a set will come out, we'll spend a couple weeks on it, and then we'll kind of stray to other topics. Uh, this is one we're going to be dialed in on Throne of Eldraine for le- like the next month. Like, yeah, I think so this, too. Yeah. Th- th- there's just too much to unpack here, and it's been a lot of fun doing so. Yeah. It's awesome. All right. So lots to look forward to. That's going to do it for the show. This week, if you want to find us on social media, I am Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV pretty much everywhere. You can find information about the podcast, including every episode ever made at LRcast.com as well as um, links to all the stuff that we do. Luis's stream, he mentioned that earlier, all that kind of stuff. Over at Channel Fireball, make sure you check out their newsletter, channelfireball.com slash newsletter to sign up for any or all uh, of those. And then the buy list, that's where you can sell your cards back to CFB and get that 30% bonus if you're trading them in for store credit. That's channelfireball.com slash buy list. That's going to do it for this one. Next week, more Throne of Eldraine. We'll see you there. You know, Marshall, it's a tragic fact that most people who – consume burritos are doing it wrong. Most burritos are made incorrectly. Talk to me. So uh, I was just in San Diego last weekend for TwitchCon and it reminded me how, well, the number one thing I miss from California is probably that my whole family lives there, you know? Uh, Mm -hmm. So, but the number two and not too far behind is the, the Mexican food in California is just out of control good. And Mm -hmm. it scales up the closer you get to actual Mexico, unsurprisingly. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. In Southern California, you know what they do with their burritos, at least the good ones? What's that? They don't put rice and beans in it. No rice and beans, huh? These burritos are so much better. So, like, you know, the, the traditional, like, California burrito, it, it will just be, like, carne asada, pico de gallo, that's, like, the, you know, salsa, guacamole, cheese, and French fries. That's the, that's <laughs> the California burrito. Or yep. you just get a burrito. The default burrito there is meat, cheese, and salsa. And then if you mm. want guac, if you want sour cream, whatever. And you know what's so good about that? You put in beans and rice because it's filler, because it's the stuff that's not as good. Right. So now you're just getting all the good stuff. Oh. Ima- imagine imagine a burrito with just no filler. This is like a draft deck with all Bs. Like, <laughs> look, you get to choose what cards you put in your deck, but you have access to all the cards. Why would you put a bunch of Bs in, or a Cs in your deck? You, you're, you're, you're just, there's no point uh, in doing that. That is great. And so are you are you going to start making them different at home? No more beans and rice. Thing is, I don't really make burritos at home all that often because I'm not uh, good at wrapping them, which is, is something I should look into. The other thing is, I guess you, what I have to do is really you have to warm the tortillas a little because this is another pro tip. If you try to wrap a burrito with a cold or or even room temperature tortilla, it's just going to break. Yeah, they crack. It'll, yeah. it'll crack. But heating them up makes them nice and pliable. But you also have to have good quality tortillas, and I'm not sure. 
you know, I really have never found a, a brand I can buy in the store that really gets me there. I, I think that, the, the, you know, the restaurants could do, do it a little better. The, the um, Denver, Denver thing. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you're, if you're in a position to either make a burrito yourself or order one at a restaurant, try getting it without rice and beans and you will be pleasantly surprised. Like it's just all action. It's just, you know, it, like I said, it, why, why waste your time on, on, on all the filler? You, you can just have all action from the beginning. It's kind of like people who watch NFL red zone, you know, like they don't, they don't want to watch everyone just lining up a penalty being called. There being a timeout. They just want to watch anytime someone's in scoring position and, you know, going for it. Like it's just all action. So it's all action. <laughs> I mean, look, there's a reason people like, you know, they, they, they like this. Netflix. There's a reason people don't want to watch ads on their stuff. They just mm-hmm. want action. And rice and beans are like the ads, uh, you know, the the the, the, the filler ads <laughs> that, that delay you from watching the video you actually want to watch. So all I'm saying you is. You really saved the good stuff for last year. <laughs> Yeah, I, re- I mean, look, th- oh, again, this man. like imagine listening to an LR that's just all sign-off. to just be all action without any of the filler <laughs> that you have to slog through to get to the part you really care about. 